was the 1980s, right? This is what the world looked like in the 1980s, bilateral, bipolar uh, configuration of power, uh, the United States and the Soviet Union. This was the 1990s. It was never actually like this, but this was what many people thought, the United States as hyperpower. And this is today, right? A bunch of different countries, Indonesia, Turkey, China, India, the EU, the US, South Africa, et cetera. That is how most people in my field think about the world. And really, if we were just doing this traditionally, I could sit down now, turn it over to Wayne and Puck. They could talk about how the fact that we have more competition means we have to renew ourselves, and that would be the end of the lecture. But I'd like to take you a little further. But that's the first rebalancing. I actually listened to what you told me the topic was here. Um, this is the second rebalancing. The first one was horizontal, right? From one state, two states, one state, multiple states. This is vertical. This is from a world of states to a world in which non-state actors, let's call them social actors. Clay Shirky says non-state actors is like calling a car a horseless carriage. So let's call these social actors. But power devolving from states to social actors. And my examples here are the UN General Assembly, which meets every September. Uh, on one side of Manhattan, it is the old world par excellence. It is all states coming together. Uh, as one, uh, the head of the European Union says, it's speed dating for diplomats. That's one side of New York. On the other side is the Clinton Global Initiative, which is one representation of how lots of different actors come together to solve global problems. If you look here, you have a CEO, you have a head of an NGO, you have a government official, you have a university professor. Those are basically the coalitions he puts together. So that is a vertical rebalancing from state power to power of social actors. It's been going on for a while. Back in the 1990s, we had uh, the Landmines Treaty, the International Criminal Court. Those were brought about by NGOs and then, then ultimately concluded by states. But this is not new. All right. I want to get at what those power shifts mean for states and for the international system. So this is the first, the, the traditional way of seeing the world a world of states as billiard balls. For those of you uh, who ever took a course in international relations, this is a very familiar way of thinking about the international system. The international system, of course, really exists in our heads in terms of there's no thing out there. There's interactions of different actors, and we can represent it any way we want. Traditionally, we thought about it as billiard balls. As we have moved from a world of states to a world of governments and social actors, We've come to a networked world, and in that networked world, those entities that we used to think of as billiard balls are nodes in much larger sets of networks. Think about a subway network. Think about states now as platforms uh, and containers for all these different networks uh, that create the society around them. So we move from a billiard ball to a networked world. In that world, foreign policy has started to shift. First, you have orchestrated coalitions. Uh, so thinking about, it's not just governments anymore. We face all sorts of problems from terrorism to the prosperity of the, the state of the global economy to climate change to global health. We are now trying to tackle those problems by top-down coalitions.